and then I'll let the people in. And then we can wait another minute or so to let everybody to get started. Okay, welcome everybody. We're um, I'm going to take another minute or so for people to join in. Some people come a little bit late, uh, but I just wanted to recognize everybody here. Welcome. Oh boy, okay, so we'll get started here shortly. Okay, um, so welcome to the program this evening. So what I'm gonna be talking about is uh, Jewish views of uh, a number of concepts about sort of life after death, the reward and punish, divine reward and punishment. Um, they have Hebrew names and sort of English equivalents. So in Hebrew, sometimes we talk about Gan Eden, which literally means the Garden of Eden, uh, but is often used to mean heaven, you know, with angels fluttering around and who knows what. Uh, the imagination of people in the early Middle Ages or whatever, Second Temple times. So Gan Eden was sort of this heaven. Um, of course, there's also the Garden of Eden in Genesis, and Maimonides thinks that that's the real Garden of Eden. But anyway, the other Hebrew term is Gehenom or Gehenim, which many people know means hell. Um, and uh, that was hell with fire and brimstone, the whole fiery burning of bad people and all that. And I'm often surprised, I often surprise many Jews by saying, yeah, Jews believed in a fiery brimstone hell. That was a very common uh, Jewish belief. Um, so that's the term for hell, Gehenim. Tehiyat HaMetim is a term for resurrection of the dead. And that was uh, another well-known uh, belief that um, at some future time, probably after the Messiah comes and the world is all at peace, people who were uh, living a good life in prior generations and didn't get to realize this beautiful world uh, would be resurrected. Their bodies would be restored in whole. Their souls would be returned to their bodies and they would live on earth in this uh, beautiful um, messianic era. So that's Tehiyat HaMetim. Yamot HaMashiach are days of the Messiah or we would say the messianic era. So that is this time when the whole world is at peace and the Jews have returned to Israel and uh, everybody's at peace with Israel, etc. And finally, Olam Haba, which means literally the world to come. Uh, Maimonides understands it as a spiritual afterlife. Okay, so those are the terms. It's all a big confusing hodgepodge. That's probably because there was no systematic voting in Talmudic times about what any of these terms would mean or how they all work together. They were the individual opinions of different rabbis of the Talmudic era, and they didn't necessarily have to all fit together as one piece. Uh, but um, Maimonides is uh, the person we're going to be looking at today who tried to systematize Jewish philosophy and uh, Jewish law. So let me describe a little about Maimonides and his life first, and then, uh, and then we'll look at the text. So Maimonides was born in Spain at what Jews consider to be the end of the Golden Age of Spain. I looked at Wikipedia and if you look at Golden Age of Spain, the rest of the world thinks the Golden Age began in 1492. For us, that was a disaster, of course. That was when we were expelled from Spain. Um, so for us, the Golden Age of Spain was much earlier during Muslim rule of Spain. Um, and uh, Maimonides was born toward the end of that time period in the year 1135 or 1138. We're not exactly sure. So what happened about 10, when he was about 10 years old, a more radical group of Muslims invaded Spain from Morocco and uh, made life very unpleasant for Jews and Christians and probably moderate Muslims as well. 
And uh, so Maimonides and his family, when he was only 10 years old, fled Spain. They went to Morocco, then they crossed over North Africa, went briefly into Israel. Uh, but Israel at that time, if you remember history, was being ruled by the Crusaders. Uh, so not a hospitable place for Jews. So they left Jerusalem and came back to settle in Egypt. And that's where he lived the rest of his life. Um, why is he so important? He is considered one of the greatest Jewish philosophers of all time. Um, and the fact, I, I mentioned the fact that he grew up in uh, the golden age of Spain for a reason. It was called the golden age in our opinion because the, the moderate Muslims who ruled there were very enlightened. They were in advanced in science and medicine and philosophy and art and literature. They translated the Greek philosophers, uh, Aristotle and Plato into Arabic so they could study them. And Maimonides grew up in that world, a, a very engaging world of intellectualism and rationalism. And Maimonides is a, a rationalist philosopher. So, uh, so that's important to know about him. He ends up settling in uh, Egypt, in, in the Jewish um, uh, suburb of Cairo, and he becomes the uh, chief physician for the Sultan there. The Sultan is well known in historical records as Salah Hadin, or in English as Saladin. Saladin was the one who led the Muslim revolt against the Christian crusaders in the Holy Land and expelled them ultimately from the Holy Land and then ruled in the Holy Land afterwards. So an important ruler and Maimonides was his personal physician and the physician for his entire palace. Uh, and he describes at some length in other writings that he would treat the people in the palace and then he'd go home to the Jewish suburb and treat all the Jewish people. And then late at night, he'd write his Jewish works. And he wrote three major Jewish works. And the first one that he wrote was when he was only 30 years old. And a piece of that is what we'll be looking at tonight. <clears throat> that was his commentary on the Mishnah, which was the sort of kernel of the Talmud that was completed in the year 200. I hope I'm explaining everything well. If anybody has any questions about any of these things, put them in the chat box. Or if I go too fast, you know, say something. But um, so anyway, so he's he writes a commentary in the Mishnah. This is unusual because the Talmud had already been completed. The rabbinic commentary on the Mishnah had already been completed. Most people are writing commentaries on the Talmud. He chose to write a commentary on the Mishnah. And in the Mishnah, his commentary, he wrote three very long essays. One essay uh, was the introduction to the Mishnah. One essay is the introduction to Pirkei Avot, which was the chapters of the fathers of a, a collection of wisdom literature of the sages. And the other essay is the one we're looking at today, his introduction to a chapter of the Talmud that talks about the afterlife. And that's where he puts his famous 13 principles of faith that became sort of the standard for Jewish beliefs after Maimonides articulated them. Until then, we didn't have any principles of faith. He said, this is what we have to believe. Um, just as a footnote to that, there have been several books written in the last few decades, including by Orthodox rabbis, who question each of those 13 principles of faith and show how later scholars uh, had different beliefs than Maimonides in each case, in each one of them. But in any case, uh, you ask the average Orthodox Jew today, and they say, oh yes, Maimonides 13 principles of faith, that's what we have to believe. So that's the essay we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is uh, put it up in share screen format and um, Jennifer is going to uh, put a link to it in the chat box if you want to download it and it'll also be available for download if you either email me later if you're watching this on video or um, later I can I'll be happy to share it with you. So um, here is his essay that ends in the 13 principles of faith, and it's a comment on the Mishnah, as I pointed out. So here is the text of the Mishnah over here that he's commenting on. And the Mishnah, by the way, there's a long essay. I underlined it and signposted it. So I'm going to kind of just focus on the parts I underlined and signposted. The rest of it's not quite so important. But if you want to read the rest of it later, you can, you're certainly welcome to do so. Okay, so uh, so here's what the Mishnah says. All Jews have a share in the world to come. That's olam haba, right? Which Maimonides will understand as a spiritual afterlife. By the way, if you're worried about non-Jews, there's a corollary to the Mishnah, 
which says that all righteous Gentiles have a portion in the world to come. So don't worry about non-Jews. As long as they're good people, they have a portion of the world to come. Now, what about the Jews? Uh, the Mishnah, after making the blanket statement that all Jews have a share in the world to come, then takes some of that back. And it says, these have no share in the world to come. Number one, a person who says that resurrection of the dead is not found in the five books of Moses. And I'll give you a hint, it's not in the five books of Moses. So therefore, anybody who reads the Torah literally or whatever will be like me, a heretic, and I don't inherit the world to come according to this Mishnah. <laughs> um, if you were wondering, the Torah rarely speaks anything at all about an afterlife. Uh, hints of it, uh, Jacob, um, when the brothers bring Joseph's bloody coat to him, he says, I will go down to Sheol, which is understood as the pit, some kind of place where you go when you die. I will go down to Sheol in mourning because my favorite son is dead and it was torn by wild beasts. So there's a hint of Sheol there. There's a hint of an afterlife in the uh, book of Samuel, uh, the King Saul um, wants to find out uh, some news of the future from the prophet Samuel, but Samuel is already dead. So he goes to a medium, somebody who consorts with the dead, and he asks her to, to bring up the spirit of the prophet Samuel, and he speaks to Samuel. There, other than that, there's very few references in the Bible about anything um, resurrection of the dead, certainly not in the five books of Moses. Also, people who say the Torah is not from heaven, that is, um, presumably that God dictated the Torah word for word to Moses, um, and Moses took dictation, and the Torah that we have today is the faithful transcription of what God uh, revealed to Moses. Um, if you are a follower of modern biblical scholarship, like I am, you don't necessarily believe that. So again, I'm not going to inherit the world to come. <laughs> Uh, and the third group of people is an atheist. That's the translation. In Hebrew, it's an apikoros, which is actually a Greek word. It comes from the Greek philosopher Apikoros, who, uh, <laughs> who believed um, uh, that this is all there is to life. There is no afterlife, right? And so his philosophy is crudely summarized by eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? So enjoy the world in all its riches in this life, because that's all there is. And if you believe that, then you don't get the afterlife, right? So you don't believe in it, you don't get it. Uh, in any case, that's what the Mishnah says. Now let's look at what Maimonides says about it. Now I told you there's these five different ideas, and he's now going to articulate them here. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention one other important thing. Maimonides is totally brilliant. He is amazingly brilliant scholar, and he knows it. <laughs> and he doesn't tolerate people who are not smart very well. So he makes a lot of snide comments about people. So just, but that's what makes it fun to read. Okay, so now you're going to read this. Um, I must now speak of the great fundamental principles of our faith. Know that the masters of the Torah hold differing opinions, that's what I would say, concerning the good which will come to a person as a result of fulfilling the commandments which God commanded us. As a consequence of their different understanding of the problem, they also hold widely different opinions concerning the evil which the transgressor suffers. So much confusion has invaded their opinions that it is almost impossible to find anyone whose opinion is uncontaminated by error. So Maimonides will now explain it all for those of us who want to know, right? Because everybody else has contaminated opinions. So here they are. One group of people thinks that the good is Garden Eden, the Garden of Eden, a place in which one eats and drinks without any physical work or effort. This would be some people's description of heaven. And they also believe that houses are made of precious stones, beds of silk, rivers flow with wine and fragrant oils, and many other things of that sort. And the evil is Gehinom, a place of raging fire in which bodies are burned and agonies of all sort are inflicted on people. Um, he's talking here, by the way, about Jews. He doesn't really care. He's not talking to Muslims. They're not reading his books. He's not talking to Christians. They're not reading his books. So when he says one group thinks this, he's talking about one group of Jews believe in this mythical Garden of Eden and this uh, heaven, so to speak, and this mythical 
Raging Fire Hell. Uh, I don't know if you can see the see the text here. A second group um, asserts that the good for which we hope is the days of the Messiah, yeah, Yemot HaMashiach, in which time all people will be angels and all of them will live forever and they will be giants in stature and they will grow in number and strength until they've occupied the entire world forever. And the Messiah will, with the help of God, live forever. And the earth will bring forth garments woven and bread ready baked. And now he kind of hints, he telegraphs to you what he thinks about all of this and many other impossible things. <laughs> People believe these impossible, crazy things about the days of the Messiah. And the evil is that a person will not be alive in those days and will not merit the privilege of seeing them. A third group holds that the good for which we hope is resurrection of the dead. And by this, they mean that a person will live after his death and return to his family and dear ones to eat and drink and never die again. And the evil is that the person will not live after his death among those who are resurrected. A fourth group holds that the goal of fulfilling the commandments is the achievement of bodily peace and mundane success like fertile lands, extensive possessions, many children, health, peace, and security. They also believe there will be a Jewish king, that is a Messiah, who will rule over those who oppressed us. Um, I, ruled over oppressed us, I'm, I'm not too keen on that expression, but let's say, to say he rules over the Jewish people and everybody recognizes him as a good person. <laughs> and the evil, which would overtake us if we deny the Torah, is the opposite of these as in our present exile, right? So we're living in not such a nice world now, but if you're lucky, you'll live at this future time when all these things will be happening. Now, you'll notice that I made a little comment in the margin there, Messiah version two. That's basically what he's saying. There's going to be a king, which is Messiah. And the difference between version two and Messiah of the uh, above is that Messiah two, the first one, the Messiah, as I noted in the um Margin here is a supernatural version of the messianic era. Things, all kinds of impossible things will be happening. And this one is really a natural messiah. It's possible, given the laws of physics, that this kind of world could exist. And so this is a natural version of the messianic era. And then he says there's a fifth group and a large one combines the opinions of all the others. And they assert that the ultimate hope is that the messiah will come he will resurrect the dead, will enter the Garden of Eden, where we'll eat and drink in perfect health forever. So those are the five opinions. And then he says, however, concerning this strange world to come, you will rarely find anyone to whom it occurs to think about it seriously or to adopt it as a fundamental doctrine of our faith or inquire what it really means, right? So he, there's some serious issues he's hinting at here. And but then he says, what everybody actually wants to know is how will the dead arise? Are they going to be naked or clothed? I mean, who wants to come back and be naked? It's embarrassing. Or whether you're going to wear the same shrouds you were buried in, or you're going to have some nice, uh, you know, fancy dress or tuxedo to wear. All right? Will you wear a plain garment or something nice? I mean, I want to know what I'm going to be wearing when I'm resurrected. Or whether when the Messiah comes, there will still be rich and poor people, weak and strong, and other kinds of questions. He considers these not serious questions. Now, one of the things you have to pay attention to is what he doesn't say in this essay. And what he doesn't say is, if these are the not serious questions, what are the serious questions? So let me give you some ideas of what, and I assume Maimonides thought of these things. You believe, if you believe in resurrection of the dead, at what age do we all get resurrected? Because there's basically two logical possibilities. One, you get resurrected as an infant and you have to start all over again. Or you get resurrected at the age you died. Um, not too many people I know want to get resurrected at the age of 96. Um, so probably the age you died is not the best time to get resurrected at. On the other hand, if we're all resurrected as infants, there's going to be hundreds of millions of infants in the world suddenly. Who's taking care of all these babies, changing their diapers and feeding them and so on and so on? That's a serious problem with resurrection of the dead. And if you want to pick some age in between, what age is that? 
13? Not too many people want to come back as 13 year old. 20? I mean, what age do you come back as? Here's another problem. If you are married and your spouse dies and then you remarry and everybody gets resurrected, who are you married to? <laughs> uh, that's a serious problem, right? I assume Maimonides thought of these. He didn't want to raise them because I believe he didn't want to disturb Jews who want to believe in resurrection of the dead. Um, I'm telegraphing here what I, what I believe Maimonides thinks about resurrection. I don't think he believed in it, but he didn't want to tell you about that here because he doesn't want to upset people. So he says, people don't seriously think about these ideas. Instead, they ask stupid questions like, am I going to be wearing clothes or not? So now he says, you, however, who read this book thoughtfully must understand the analogy which I'm about to draw for you. So this is analogy number one. Imagine a small child who has been brought to his teacher so that he may be taught the Torah, right? Torah we understand as wisdom generally, right? So he's going to learn wisdom, which is the ultimate good because it will bring him to perfection, right? The, one of the things that distinguishes human beings from animals is our ability to, we believe, to have this wisdom that is beyond anything animals can understand because of language and, and so on. So um, learning, learning wisdom will make you the ultimate human being. However, because this person is only a child, the, person's under, the child's understanding is deficient. He doesn't grasp the true value of the goodness that he'll get from learning, nor does he understand perfection which he can achieve by means of wisdom. Therefore, his teacher must bribe him to study by means of things which the child loves in a childish way. Right, and we all know how this works. You give him a bit of honey, he says. Today we would say a Hershey bar. <laughs> we give him some chocolate. Well, if you study this, I will give you some cookies or a, a piece of chocolate cake or something. He doesn't work hard for the sake of reading. He works hard in order to get the cookies. Therefore, he thinks of study as work and effort, but he's willing to do it in order to get what he wants. As the child grows and his mind improves, you have to give them something a little more substantive. So you say, read these things and I'll buy you a new pair of shoes or a nice, a nice suit or a nice dress, you know, and then, you know, you'll, it, that's a nicer thing than just candy, which you eat and then it's done, right? You'll have something nicer that's a little more permanent, a little more substantive. So study a little more and I'll give you something really nice. As the child's intelligence improves more, you have to do something even better. Learn this passage or this chapter, and I'll give you a dinar or two, right? I'll give you $10 for every A on your report card. <laughs> and again, they're not learning so that they can learn. They're learning so they can get the $10. The end which he seeks is to, ach to achieve through his study is to acquire the money. He'll um, <clears throat> when his understanding has improved even more, he will desire something more honorable. And now you say to him, study so that you may become president of a court or a judge, or that people will honor you and rise before you as they honor so-and-so. Now notice what he's done here. This is an important thing. He's changed the reward from a physical reward, some candy or clothes or money, into a non-physical, intangible reward, honor, respect, dignity, right? So there's something a little intangible there, that's an important shift he's made. And that's when you're more sophisticated, you're more persuaded by doing something for these intangible rewards. However, he now says, all of this is deplorable. However, it's unavoidable because of humanity's limited insight, as a result of which we make the goal of wisdom something other than wisdom itself and assume that the purpose of study is the acquisition of honor, which makes a mockery of truth. Our sages call this learning not for its own sake. In Hebrew, that's Torah lo lishma, Torah wisdom that's learned not for its own sake. And Torah lishma is learning for its own sake. You should learn because you want to become wise, period, because wisdom is good for you, right? And so our sages said, don't make Torah a crown for self-glorification or a spade with which to dig. One ought not to busy oneself with God's Torah in order to earn one's living. Uh, he's talking to me. Nor should the end of studying wisdom be anything but knowing it. The truth has no other purpose than knowing that it's true. 
So a good person should not wonder if I perform these commandments, which are virtues, and I refrain from these transgressions, which are vices, because God commanded us not to do so. What am I going to get out of it? Don't ask that question. It's not about what you get out of it, right? But, um, you know, for those people who ask that question, you answer the fool according to his folly, right? Uh, you have to answer them with something they understand because they don't get the value of learning itself. Our sages have already warned us about this. They said one should not make the goal of one's service to God of, or of doing the commandments anything in the world of things. Do not be like the servants, it says in Pirkei Avot, which he's, you know, that was the chapter that he spent a, another long essay on. Do not be like the servants who serve their master for the sake of receiving a reward, but be like the servants who serve their master without expecting a reward. You should do God's will without expecting a reward for doing it. And should you be tempted to say, I'm going to study Torah in order to become rich or in order to be called a rabbi, again, he's talking to me, <laughs> or in order to uh, receive a reward in the world to come, the scripture says to love the Lord your God. Whatever you do it, do it only out of love. This is probably the most important statement in the whole essay. The reason for following the commandments and learning the Torah, which we understand as wisdom, is because you love the creator. You, if you love the creator, you will obviously want to become wise and want to be good. Because what else would you do if you loved God's creation and, and God as the creator? However, our sages knew that this is a very difficult goal to achieve. Not everyone can achieve it because people do not do anything except in order to achieve profit or to avoid loss. And here is the most shocking statement in his entire essay. Therefore, in order that the masses stay faithful and do the commandments, it was permitted to tell them that they might hope for a reward and to warn them against transgressions out of fear of punishment. He seems to be saying here, there is no reward and there is no punishment. We only talk about those terms because the masses don't get it. He's gonna take this back a little bit at the end of the essay, but right now it's really amazing that he just comes out and says, it. there's no reward, there's no punishment. We only say that so the people will behave. Right, he, he, he expands on that. The masses, after all, lose nothing when they do the commandments out of fear of punishment or hope for reward, since they're not perfect. And out of this effort, they may be awakened to the knowledge of the truth and serve God out of love. Right, and there's an expression in rabbinic literature, mitoch shelolishma, balishma. Even when you start out doing something not for its own sake, you will come to eventually do it for its own sake when you realize how valuable it is. So you may start out doing the commandments because you're afraid of rewards and punishments or whatever, but eventually you may hopefully come to do it because you love God, right? Which is the real purpose of doing the commandments. Okay, so that's one uh, analogy. It's about children learning and getting rewards and punishments. Here is a digression now of a different kind. He's now going to explain what the different what different expressions of the sages mean. So he says, you must know that the words of the sages are differently interpreted by three groups of people. The first group is the largest one. Again, he's talking about Jews. They accept the teachings of the sages in their simple, literal sense, and do not think that these teachings contain any hidden meaning at all. They believe all sorts of impossible things must be. There's a story uh, I told to another group uh, last week of, about, uh, they dealt with Purim. Uh, a rabbi invites his friend over for a Purim party. They get drunk. And uh, because they're totally drunk, the, the host kills his guest by accident. And he wakes up from his drunken stupor the next day and he realizes his guest is dead. And he prays to God for a miracle and his dead is revived, comes back to life, right? That is an impossible thing. Right, so Maimonides is saying there are people who believe that story literally. That really happened. Okay, uh, he says they hold these opinions because they don't understand science. They believe that the sages intended no more uh, than a straightforward what they uh, mean, uh, meaning of the words. Uh, nothing more than what they are able to understand with their inadequate knowledge, in spite of the fact that some of their teachings, when taken literally, are so fantastic and irrational 
that if you were repeat, to repeat them literally, even to an uneducated person, let alone a sophisticated scholar, their amazement would prompt them to ask how anyone in the world could believe such a crazy thing, right? How could you believe somebody kills somebody the next morning, he makes them come back to life again? What a ridiculous idea that is. But there's people out there who believe these stories literally, and Maimonides is saying, that's just nonsense. The members of this group are poor in knowledge. One can only regret their folly. Their very effort to honor and exalt the sages actually humiliates them and destroys the glory of the Torah and extinguishes its light. Because God told us that when people hear the words of wisdom from our Torah, these other nations will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. But this group, the one that takes the sages literally, um, when, they, when they repeat these things, other people hear them, they'll say this people is a little foolish and ignoble people. What, what a bunch of dummies, they believe this nonsense. <laughs> so Maimonides says, it'd be better if they just shut up. Better that they should just keep silent about what they don't know. They're already following so far. Is anybody, any issues so far? Okay, a second group of people is so numerous. Now, also a numerous one. They under also understand that the sages uh, meant what they said literally, uh, but they declare the sages to be fools and hold them up to contempt. I mean, if you believe that the rabbi could bring somebody back to life, you're an idiot. So the rabbis must have been idiots, <laughs> right? They believe the rabbis meant their stories to be taken literally, and therefore the rabbis are idiots. The sages were simple-minded, suffered from inferior intelligence. Maimonides says, the members of this group are so pretentiously stupid that they can never attain genuine wisdom. They regard themselves as cultivated people, scientists, critics, and philosophers. They are more stupid than the first group. Many of them are simply fools. They're an accursed group, okay? That's the end of them. Then there's the third group of people. And its members are so few in number that it's hardly appropriate to call them a group, except in the sense that one speaks of the sun as a group. How many members of the group are there when you're talking about the sun? There's just one sun. <laughs> and it's the only member. So Maimonides is, again, very arrogant, uh, would almost seem to be saying he is the only one who really understands the sages. Maybe there's a handful of other people. <laughs> Uh, right, so but this is a small group, right? And for them, they say that whenever the sages spoke of things that seem impossible, they were employing a style of riddle or parable, which is the method of truly great thinkers. All students of rhetoric know the real concern of a riddle is its hinted meaning, not with its obvious meaning. And since the words of the sages deal with supernatural matters, which are ultimate, they must be expressed in riddles and analogies. Let me... Uh, stop sharing for a second and just say that um, he's, he's, um, um, he, he's not using language in, that we would use in the 21st century. If he lived in the 21st century, he would say, God exists outside of the space-time continuum, right? God, we, we as Jews have always said, God doesn't have a physical body. What does it mean not to have a physical body? God doesn't take up space. God does, is not a thing that exists in space. And if, as Einstein said, you don't exist in space, you also don't exist in time. And that, of course, explains one of the conundrums, which I never understood when I was a kid. How can God be everywhere all the time? And the answer is, God is outside of that space-time continuum, right? So that's how God can be everywhere all the time. And what Maimonides is saying is, when you're talking about a spiritual being that doesn't exist and can't be described with the five physical senses because our senses only allow us to understand the physical world and God isn't in the physical world, you're forced to use metaphors and parables, right? So that's what he's saying. Okay, so uh, so let's go on. So he, um, so um, it is often difficult for us to interpret the words and deduce their true meaning from the form that they contain, but their real inner meanings confirm, uh, conforms to reason and corresponds with truth. The whole book of Job, he says, um, may be a metaphor. It didn't really happen. It's just a story that's told to explain it. The dead bones of Ezekiel are a metaphor, right? Examples that he gives. Now, if you, reader, he's talking to us, 
belong to either of the first two groups. Pay no attention to my words or anything else in this section. If you believe the sages meant things literally, whether you disparage them or like them, stop reading now. You're just going to get irritated and you're going to hate what I'm going to say. <laughs> but if you belong to the third group uh, and you understand that the sages spoke in metaphors, when you encounter a word of the sages that seems to conflict with reason, you'll realize that this utterance must be a riddle or a parable. Okay, so that's his second digression. And if you consider my book in this spirit, then per, with the help of God, it may help you here. So now he says, I'm going to discuss the matter which I'm really concerned. And I noted here in the margin, not really. Um, he has one more detour to make before he gets down to business. Before we talk about heaven and hell and the afterlife, he's got one more thing he needs to tell us. Know that just as a blind person cannot imagine color, Right? If somebody is blind from birth, how do you describe to such a person the difference between brown and blue? Very hard to do. A person who is deaf may be able to feel vibrations, but how would you describe to them Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? Right? It's, they, they don't have the, the sensory perceptors to appreciate this particular medium. Right, So blind people can't imagine color. Deaf people can't experience exquisite sounds and music, let's say. Uh, he adds that eunuchs can't feel sexual desire. And in the same way, bodies cannot attain spiritual delights. Again, our physical senses, touch, sight, smell, taste, and, and sound, are designed to sense the physical world. Spiritual delights can't be sensed with any of those, any of the five senses, right? So how can we be expected to really understand the spiritual realm? Just like fish, who, and of course, in those days, you all know that there were four elements, right? They didn't know about the periodic table, right? So water and fire are opposites, earth and air are opposites, right? So he says fish who live in water don't know what fire is because they live in its opposite, the element of water, right? So fire doesn't exist in water, so how would you describe to a fish what a fire is? You wouldn't be able to do it. So are the delights of the spiritual world unknown in this material world. We enjoy only bodily pleasures, which come to us through our physical senses. Um, to get this spiritual sense, you really need to do some searching. And an uh, analogy for this would be about uh, the emotion of love, right? How do you explain love? It's not something that we perceive exactly with any of our senses, and yet we know it's real, and we have a sense of it, and we try to describe it. And of course, we end up using metaphors to describe love. And he's kind of saying, well, the same way you can try and, and get your hands, so to speak, around, look at the language I'm using, get your hands around love, so to speak, right? You have to use your spiritual perceptors to understand spiritual matters like God and ultimate wisdom. Um, and you can do it, but you have to do a lot of searching. Uh, and he notes that spiritual delights are eternal, right? They don't exist. He would uh, today he would say they don't exist in space. Therefore, they don't exist in time. So they, they are forever, right? Um, uh, and again, this is bad science. You know, angels, stars. They believe stars were sort of spiritual beings. Uh, the spheres experience no. You can't say they don't experience delight. They experience great delight in that they uh, just go with his analogy here, even though it's bad science. They experienced the true being of God, the creator. With this knowledge, they enjoy delight that is both forever and uninterrupted. And then he says, we will be like them after we die. Those people who choose to purify themselves will reach this spiritual height. They will neither experience body, bodily pleasures, nor will they want them. Right? When you're in that spiritual realm and you're intensely involved with wisdom and God's presence, everything else is going to fade into insignificance. You are not going to be interested in physical things anymore. Thus, you may find that most people will exert, he's giving an example here, extraordinary amounts of intellectual and physical energy to achieve honor, not something that's physical. Remember, that was the highest level of reward that you give somebody for learning. And not a physical reward, a kind of a, a quasi-spiritual reward, honor, something that can't be physically quantified, 
right? But you'll people will go to great lengths to achieve it. And they will um, deny themselves the keenest bodily delights because they fear shame or public disgrace. Again, something not quantifiable, but people will go to great lengths to avoid shame and disgrace, right? So if this is the case, even in this material world, how much more so will it be in the spiritual world? And that he says is olam haba, the world to come. The spiritual realm is the world olam haba for Maimonides. In this world to come, our souls will become wise out of knowledge of God, the creator, the spiritual delight is not divisible into parts, nor can it be described, nor can any analogy really explain it. So our sages wrote, he says, in the world to come, there's no eating, no drinking, no washing, no anointing, no sexual intercourse, but the righteous sit with crowns on their heads and enjoy the radiance of the divine presence. Now he has to explain what does it mean to have crowns on your heads if you don't have a body? And how do you uh, enjoy the radiance of divine presence? So he says, the expression crowns on their heads signifies the immortality of the soul being in firm possession of the idea, which is God of the creator. You're plugged right into God. That's what it means to have a crown on your head. And the expression they delight in the radiance of God's presence means the souls enjoy blissful delight in their attainment of knowledge of the truly essential nature of God and creator, a delight which is like that experienced by holy angels who know his existence firsthand. Okay. So now he's given the overview, and now he's going to come and explain all those elements that we talked about before. So the ultimate good, what is your ultimate reward for being a good person? The final end is to achieve this eternal fellowship, to participate in the high glory in which the soul is forever involved with the existence of God creator, who is the cause and source of its existence. And this is incomparably good, right? This olam haba is what your soul really craves. And the utterly evil punishment consists in cutting off of the soul so it perishes and doesn't live eternally. That's the penalty, which is called karet in Hebrew, which literally means to be cut off. Your soul is cut off from God's presence forever. When your body dies, your soul ceases to exist. He says it follows that if a person has deliberately and regularly chosen physical delights, Right? You've uh, been hedonistic and in, indulged yourself, gorged yourself, despised the truth, loved falsehood, you've tortured your mind, and you've done all kinds of mean and nasty things. You basically tortured your soul, and he will be cut off from the high level of being that remain and remain disconnected matter. Um, so to explain it in the way I would explain it, he's, he said originally, kind of said there's no reward and there's no punishment. And in a way, that's true, because reward is something artificial that you get when you do something, right? The chocolate bar has nothing to do with learning. The shoes have nothing to do with learning. The, uh, you know, the clothes or whatever it is, the money doesn't have anything to do with learning. It's artificially given to you by a third party because they want you to learn. That's a reward. What Maimonides is describing here is a natural consequence of your actions. You were good, you sought to expand your mind and your soul, and you did good deeds for people. And as we know, when we do good things for people, we feel better, that nurtures your soul. So your soul grows in strength and strength and strength. And then when your body ceases to function, your soul is so strong that it can exist without the body's functioning. And it then is united with God. On the other hand, if you torture your soul, by denying truth and ignoring wisdom and doing horrible things to people so that you feel miserable, you crush your soul and your soul becomes so weak that it can't exist when your body stops functioning. And so it just dies. And that is for Maimonides, like the worst thing that could happen to your soul. There are some problems with this. So if you want to um, raise the problems afterwards, you're welcome to do that. But I, I like generally the concept because what he's saying is this is not a supernatural thing. This is actually part of a natural process. Um, okay, so now he's gonna talk about the Garden of Eden. So what is the Garden of Eden for Maimonides? Well, it's a fertile place containing the choicest of the earth's resources, numerous rivers and fruit bearing trees. God will disclose it to us someday. 
None of this is impossible or improbable. So I like to say that if God knew about Bali or name your favorite um, paradise island, <laughs> and you would say, oh, that's the Garden of Eden. We found it, right? Some lush, beautiful garden island somewhere, somewhere. That's, that's the Garden of Eden. It's nothing supernatural, just a very nice, beautiful place, lush and verdant. Gehenna, pay close attention to what he says here. This was the fire and brimstone. It's a name for the pain and the punishment which will come to the wicked, he says. No specific description of this punishment is contained in the Talmud. One teacher says the sun will come so close to the wicked person it will burn them. Others say that a strange heat will be produced from within their bodies to incinerate them. And then he goes on to another subject. So you have to pay close attention again to what he did not say. He said some people believe this and other people believe that. But that, you know, it's whatever the punishment is that comes to the wicked. So what does Maimonides think the punishment is that comes to the wicked? Not fire and brimstone at all. He told you already, your soul is cut off. It ceases to exist. There's no fire and brimstone, you just die. But he doesn't want to say that because too many Jews believe in fire and brimstone. So he kind of does this kind of sleight of hand thing. <laughs> right, where he says, well, some people think this and other people think that, and, but it's the punishment that comes to the wicked. He already told you what that is. Resurrection of the dead. This is the key thing, right? Resurrection, bodily resurrection. That is the one of the cardinal principles established by Moses, our teacher. After all, it says so in the Mishnah, right? You have to believe in that. A person who doesn't believe in that has no real religion, certainly not Judaism, but resurrection is only for the righteous. And then at the end of the paragraph, he says, but all men, all people must die and their bodies decompose. So what does Maimonides really think about resurrection? Remember at the beginning of the essay, he said, nobody thinks seriously about this issue. They all wanna know where they're gonna be clothed and what kind of clothes they're gonna wear. Maybe whatever, nobody thinks about the serious issues, like what age are you gonna be and who are you married to? And does he answer any of those problems? No. He just says, well, of course you have to believe in resurrection. End of story. But everybody dies and their bodies decompose. So it seems like on the one hand, he says it's there. You have to believe in it. On the other hand, it says, um, yeah, no, you're going to die and your body's going to decompose. So I think because of that, he doesn't really believe in resurrection. I'm not the only one. After he wrote this, he was considered a heretic by some people. He ended up writing a whole essay about how he really does believe in resurrection. I'm still not impressed. <laughs> I think, you know, this is where he said, we tell people about resurrection because that's what they want to hear. Uh, but really, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, the real problem for Maimonides would be it defies the laws of physics. Once your body decomposes, why would it come back together again? You know, how does that happen? That's a miracle. That's something supernatural. And Maimonides doesn't seem to believe in supernatural things. Okay, then comes the days of the Messiah, right? So there were two versions of Messiah, the natural and the supernatural. So this is how he describes it. Sovereignty will revert to Israel. Okay, that happened already. Jews will return to the land of Israel. I think by now or very soon, the majority of the Jews in the world will be living in Israel. Maybe not all of them, but certainly a larger percentage of Jews live in Israel now than have for probably 2,500 years since before the destruction of the first temple. Uh, their king will be a very great one. Uh, you can argue, we don't have a king, we have a prime minister. Uh, question of whether you think the prime minister is the king, whether he's great, uh, that's a questionable thing. Royal palace will be in Zion. That's easy to do now, we're in Jerusalem. His name and his reputation will extend throughout all nations in greater measure than King Solomon. That's easy with the internet and television. Um, all nations will make peace with him. Ah, there's a big problem, right? So we have to make peace with everybody or everybody has to make peace with us. All countries will serve him out of respect for his great righteousness and wonders which occurred to him. Again, I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea of serving, but the idea that anyway, Israel will be respected as a good nation, that certainly isn't the case now, but hopefully sometime in the future. All those who rise against it will be destroyed. Right? We won't have any enemies anymore. However, he says, 
except for the fact that sovereignty will revert to Israel, nothing will be essentially different from what it is now. He does not believe in a supernatural messianic era. Everything will be still according to the laws of nature. There will still be rich and poor, strong and weak. A minimum of labor will produce great benefits. And if Maimonides were alive today to see how easy it is to make bread or buy bread in the store or buy clothes at uh, Walmart, he would be amazed. Um, you know, with modern technology, it truly is a minimum of labor to greet, produce great benefits. And he says, this is what the sages meant when in the future, the land of Israel will bring forth red, uh, ready baked rolls and fine woolen garments. Don't take that literally, he's saying. That's a metaphor, right? That bread will be easy to acquire. Garments will be easy to acquire. And they certainly are today for the most part. He says, that's what they meant by so-and-so has found his bread already baked and his meal already cooked, right? You can actually do this today. You go to the supermarket, buy a frozen meal, cook it in your microwave in five minutes and eat it. Uh, the great benefits which will occur in those days will are, are released from oppression of other kingdoms, widespread increase of wisdom, the end of wars, right? Everybody will be at peace. Perfection will be widespread with the result that everyone will merit the life of the world to come. Once we have this big peace dividend and everybody's living happily together, wisdom will expand. Everybody can become wise. Everybody's going to inherit the world to come. No problem. But he says the Messiah will die. His reign may be longer. All human life will be longer, right? You'll have a peace dividend. People won't be killed for all kinds of other reasons. There'll be no more worries and troubles. So health issues will be more resolved. We don't long and hope for the days of the Messiah because of an increase of productivity and wealth, but rather because righteous will be gathered together in fellowship and goodness and wisdom will prevail. That's what we hope for when we hope for the Messianic era, peace, Fellowship, goodness, wisdom, that's why we want the Messianic era. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the world to come is the ultimate good uh, which, we all, uh, which we're all devoted to. And that's what it means when it says all Jews have a share in the world to come. Um, but even so, you shouldn't serve God in order to get this world to come, but only to serve God out of love and so on. Uh, and then he says at the end here, I've expatiated on these points precisely in order to teach those with no training in theology, a subject which not every person can understand. Then comes his 13 principles of faith. I just wanna to go to the end because that talks about our subject. The 11th principle is God rewards those who perform the commandments and the greatest reward is the world to come and the worst punishment is extinction, right? He says it again, that's the reward and punishment. The 12th principle is the Messianic era. And uh, you should not set any time limit for it. Don't make any assumptions about when it's gonna happen based on scriptures. When it happens, it happens. But we hope that one day there'll be a Messianic era and everybody will live in peace and harmony. And the 13th principle, this is again the shocking thing, is you have to believe in resurrection of the dead, which we have already explicated. But did he really explicate it? He never. He never really did. So again, this is another hint that he is trying to do a little bit of a sleight of hand here and kind of brush, brush it aside. I think Maimonides, when he used the expression tamaitim, which, which is understood to mean bodily resurrection of the dead, it literally means bringing life to the dead. And I think when he used that expression tamaitim, he meant himself internally the same thing as Olam Haba. It's a spiritual life after death, not a bodily life after death. But, um, but he certainly didn't explain anything about the problems of um, bodily resurrection. Okay, so that's uh, Maimonides in short on all those subjects. So now uh, if anybody has questions, I know I kind of went through a whole lot of material pretty quickly. Hopefully people have questions. Everything is obvious now, since Maimonides explained it all. <laughs> so if uh, moving a little bit away from Maimonides, 
and in particular resurrection, um, couldn't, uh, certainly this would also be a metaphor that the soul uh, goes af after death, goes wherever it goes and is also outside of space and time. Yes, I think that's I, I think that's how Maimonides would describe it in the 21st century. <laughs> I don't think he had quite the terms to use back then, but I think that's what he had in mind. And what about migration of the soul? Uh, and, mean reincarnation? Uh, well, that's one form of it. There's there's others, but yeah. Yeah, reinc so, uh, reincarnation enters into the Jewish world in, in mysticism, Kabbalah. So I'm going to punt that question to Rabbi Horwitz, our expert on Kabbalah. But to me, as a, you know, a rationalist philosopher, I don't see how that fits particularly with resurrection of the dead or any of the other. Like, once you're in Olam Haba, why do you want to come back to this world in any form? Right. So for Maimonides, I don't think reincarnation makes sense. And if you believe in resurrection of the dead and you're reincarnated in several different bodies, I guess you go back, come back as the last body you were in. I mean, I don't know. Which body do you come back as, you know? Or do you uh, really come back at all? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so. Um, you know, th does, does every um, physical body that ever existed come in, back? Uh, do, well, does it have its own soul or does the soul go from one to another? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm again, I'm, I'm not a, I don't personally believe in reincarnation, even though that is, you know, a Kabbalistic belief. Uh, but I suppose for those who believe in reincarnation, I imagine they work it out somehow. You come back, you either come, you, uh, may, maybe you, you keep getting reincarnated until your soul finally achieves that perfect state. And then you go to Alam Haba and don't come back. I don't know. Maybe they don't believe in resurrection, but then they have the problem that the Mishnah says you have to believe in resurrection. So either you're like Maimonides and say, well, I'm going to pretend that means Alam Haba. <laughs> Or I don't know what you do with that. But um, anyway, that's the migration of souls, I guess. That's how I, I, that's how I would explain that. I mean, the advantage of migration of souls, the, I think the reason why people have a tendency to believe that is that um, it's hard to understand why bad things happen to good people. And usually this idea of migration of souls is coming to explain that phenomenon by saying, well, that's something you did in a prior life. A prior life, you were really bad. So now you're paying for it in this life. Um, I have trouble the, with the that. The soul is paying for it. What? Your soul, soul is paying for it. Yes, yes, right. So I, I'm, again, it's not something that I personally believe in. I find that a little strange. But if, it, if some people find very comfort in that and believe it, and, you know, look, it's a Jewish belief. If that's your belief, good to hate, as they say, right? Maybe may you live in hell, good health. <laughs> <clears throat> Anybody else? I put a yes a question in the chat box. It was, um, is there such a thing in Judaism as an in between place, similar to a purgatory type place? Yes, yes. The traditional Jewish belief is that before you go to Alam Haba, everybody's going to end up getting there. There's a, like, there is, if you ask uh, many Orthodox people today, and uh, maybe not Orthodox people today, um, they will tell you that almost everybody's going to end up in Alam Haba, right? And because, uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes, so there'll be some whatever issues. But so when you die, you go to this in-between place, and that's where you're, you know, they describe it different ways. Again, it's all metaphorical language. Your soul is purged or somehow cleansed or something like that. Basically, it's like purgatory um, uh, for a period of time. And then you, uh, your perfected soul goes to Alam Haba. And the sort of folk wisdom is that this process shouldn't take longer than a year uh, for even very bad people. Uh, maybe not Hitler bad, but, you know, normally bad people. And... Um, and so that is a folk reason why some people say Kaddish for their parents for 11 months, because uh, nobody's parents are so bad they have to go for 12 months. So <laughs> you're saying Kaddish for 11 months somehow helps their soul get through that purgatory stage. Um, 
again, I'm not a particular believer in that particular aspect of Kaddish. I think Kaddish is a way that you honor your parents and demonstrate that they raised you to be a conscientious and good person. Uh, and that you recognize the wonders of God's universe um, uh, while, you know, while working through your grief. And you do it in a community, right? So you're not isolated. But there is a folk idea that you're doing it for, for the soul in this uh, purgatory stage. Um, question yeah. related to that. A um, hundred years ago, we were taught that that was also the time in which the living could make reparation, for lack of a better word, to the <clears throat> person who had passed away, particularly when it was a not so much a parent, but a sibling or someone else yeah. that one might have hurt or somehow I don't know, does that sound right? Does yeah, I mean, I think that, that's that's part, that's part of this idea, right? You're saying Kaddish, and somehow that helps repair their spiritual afterlife, right? So that helps them uh, maybe repairing them, maybe it demonstrates a repair of their mistakes in the world or something like that. Yeah, that there's some balancing of scales because you're showing that they, you know, that, that, um, they at least raised you to be a good person and 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 do whatever i mean so there, there may be something like that yeah yeah it was it was not so much um uh focused on the parents um and their oh yeah so right it, it could be yeah, right it could we be were anybody, the people right, who yes. were doing things who were asking their forgiveness yes. particularly when it was not a parent when it's a sibling or something yes right that's possible yeah so um so it's it's possible that uh, you know for other for other people as well. And if some people ask me, by the way, can I say Kaddish even if I'm not required to, like for a friend, right, or uh, somebody I'm not required to say Kaddish at all for? And my view is, you know, you're saying Kaddish because you're mourning, and whether you're required to say Kaddish or not, you can say Kaddish. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, just mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm very liberal about these things, and uh, and. Um, so it's your way of demonstrating that you are mourning the loss of your friend and uh and maybe in some way helping them if you believe that's the case um but uh i i think you should do that and and other people say what with my brother or my spouse you know you're only supposed to say cottage for 30 days yeah. but some people feel like you know my my child i lost if i lost a child i'm really in grief today you know that's a that's a dr dramatic traumatic thing um, I want to say Kaddish for 11 months. So I would say, say Kaddish for 11 months. Is it that you're not supposed to say Kaddish for more than 30 days or you're not obligated to say Kaddish? Yeah, so my days? view is you're not obligated, right? Which does not preempt you from doing it anyway, right? I mean, what's wrong with saying Kaddish? You're magnifying and sanctifying God's name. <laughs> we, we say Kaddish like six times during the Shakri service. Yeah, a lot, <laughs> lots of times, yes, right, exactly, right. So why not? That's my view, anyway. Yeah. Anybody else? Is there, was there something else in the chat box there? Oh, oh just OK. Do you want to? I'll ask the question. You can say, you know what? We're not going to talk about this. That's, that's OK. Um, <laughs> but if God is powerful enough, let's not even say all powerful, but powerful enough to uh, resurrect uh bodies in whatever form that might take or uh, physically or spiritually um why the concern prohibition lack of uh, discouragement of something like cremation or not having all the body parts yeah oh so all right so yeah just briefly on that so um so cremation um is is really a problem of defacing the vessel which held your soul right so the vessel which held your soul is considered holy and just like you would bury a talit or bury a, a torah scroll or a, a book of sacred literature you don't just uh you just don't throw it in the trash your body also shouldn't be just thrown in the trash or burned or something like that you should treat it with dignity and bury it that's the reason for burial um, nowadays, of course, after the Holocaust, there's an additional reason the Nazis burned our bodies, and so we're not going to burn our bodies. Um, 
the thing about not having all your body parts. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, your 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 point is well taken, and that's what Saadia Gaon said a thousand years ago. Right? So a thousand years ago, somebody asked Saadia Gaon, um, "How am I going to be resurrected? I lost my arm in an accident or in battle or something like that." You know, and so now I don't have an arm. If I'm resurrected, I won't have an arm. And Saad Yagaon said, don't worry. God created Adam out of dirt. Whatever's left of your body, he can recreate your body with. <laughs> um, so, uh, for, but again, that sort of, vi as you pointed out, violates the laws of physics, right? So, which is one reason why I think Maimonides doesn't believe in it. But if you believe that God can do that, then yeah, by all means, God can resurrect you out of whatever's there, right? Even if there's nothing there, it'll recreate your body. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, joining tonight, and I uh, hope you all have a good evening. And, and please feel free to ask questions later, or if you want a copy of the text, if you didn't or weren't able to download it, uh, just ask me, and I can email it to you. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.